everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our program tonight. We are really excited to talk to Ed Stana and learn more about their collection at our Artist One Chicago exhibition at the Hyde Park Art Center. Artist One Chicago is a big and ubiquitous exhibition that takes over our entire building featuring 50 artist run spaces across Chicago and one in Milwaukee as well. Really excited to have Kaylee Wyant here from Ads Donna. I'm going to hand it over to you and we'll get started with the artist today. Thank you. Ooh. All right, thank you, Sierra. Um, again, my name is Kaylee. Welcome everybody. Welcome artists. Thank you for participating. Welcome to the guests that are tuning in live here. Um, so just a little brief intro, I guess, Ad Stana is an artist-run space, super excited to be a part of this um, Hyde Park Art Center's um, artist-run Chicago 2.0. We um, have been operating for, this, is, this will be our 11th uh, season come this fall. Wow. Um, so we are a collective and artist-run gallery uh, that has fluctuated uh, between different artists over the years. Currently, we are at six members. I think, uh, is Bobby here? Oh, yep, there she is. <laughs> One of our co-directors is, is with us as a, as a presenter tonight too, Bobby Meyer. Um, and so the, I, when I put together this proposal for um, the Hyde Park Art Center show, I was inspired by actually one of our um, another past show of ours, which what took place in 2016. And it was, um, it was basically about artists' collections. So what they collect in their own home, so them collecting other artworks. And so we had reached out to a bunch of um, artists over the, that we'd worked with over the years and um, asked them to share an artwork that they had in their home collection. And so it was really a wonderful presentation of seeing this web of influence, you know, like, I don't know about you guys, but I love going into artists' homes and in their studios and seeing, seeing, you know, the artwork that they surround themselves by. And often it's like, there's a lot of stories behind all of that hidden, you know, like relationships, whether it's um, old professors or people that they went to school with, et cetera, um, friends, colleagues, you know, I just, I love those stories that are revealed by artists' collections. Um, and so on a similar vein, I decided that we would kind of revisit this idea, but instead of showing artworks that artists collect, we'd show the weird objects that are hidden away in their studios, in their homes, or, you know, proudly on display, because um, that's something else that I've relished seeing, you know, whenever I'm on a studio visit, seeing all the, um, all the interesting objects and little snippets of things tacked to studio walls that, you know, have yeah, some kind of, um, connection, you know, whether it's visual or conceptual to, um, to their practice. And so anyway, we've, we've invited um, a number of artists to share those with us. They're on display at the Hyde Park Art Center now. You can see them in the, in the slide uh, that's being presented right now. And we have a, a handful of artists that are participating that are just going to We'll go kind of one by one and they can um, look at, they can uh, introduce the object that they're sharing and just tell us a little bit about it. This doesn't have to be super formal. Um, I'd love to know if it has something, if it inspires your work in some way, maybe it doesn't, maybe it's just a kooky story that you want to share. That's, that's fine too. Um, I think we're all just here to kind of learn about these interesting objects. Um, that are on display. So any questions? All right. Um, I think on my slideshow, I've, I just, um, I've, I've got people's artwork up and apologies if this was not the artwork that was uh, you sent to me, but I had to get started on this a little ahead of time. So when I, when I come to your artwork, maybe just wave um, and you don't have to do a formal introduction, just uh, kind of say hi, that way we can match faces to, um, to the artwork. And then we'll cycle through and I'll get to people's actual objects. And then we can start taking turns to share about those objects. Sound good? Um, all right, so, oops, here we go. I think, um, okay. Judith? Uh, that's me, Judith Geichmann. Okay. 
Do you, um, do you want me to say any? Oh, okay. Oh. I guess not. <laughs> if you want to, yeah. Why not? Just a quick introduction, no, I guess. I guess I picked this image because it's a collection of my own work that I have done through, oh my goodness, um, long time. So at different uh, states of my uh, working process. And I really like these things. So they're up in my wall as a kind of teacher, uh, a support, a reminder of, of what I'm interested in. Great. Thank you. Oops, wrong way. And Phyllis? Hey, well, I'm, I did, I'm doing a presentation, just a warning. Oh, okay. <laughs> no and I'm taking them. Okay, no problem. Well, you can just say hi then. <laughs> Just say hi and then wait till later. I'll, yeah, sure. Okay. That's hi. fine. Okay. <laughs> and we've got Eric Wenzel. And Deirdre Fox. There we go. Bobby Meyer. Oh, nice, Bobby. <laughs> and Matt Morris. Me. <laughs> oh, that's me. Kaylee Wine again. And Betsy Odom, mm -hmm. there we go. Kayla Anderson. Hi. Hello. <laughs> I love your background. <laughs> Thanks, my, I just moved into a new apartment, so there's actually nothing behind me. Oh. <laughs> so I <laughs> wanted to have something. <laughs> anyway. Oh, did I, did I do that twice? Whoops. Um, oh, no, this is the, this is the presentation now. Um, so this is in kind of a random order. So, uh, Betsy, if you're ready to just share about, tell us a little bit about these objects. Uh, we'd love to hear, um, yeah, where they came from and why you, why, why you've hung on to them for. <coughs> so take it away. Okay. Yes. Um, so yeah, I'm a, uh, frequent patron of antique malls. Um, you know, I'm a sculpture maker, so I think a lot about like how we relate to objects. And I feel like tchotchkes like this really speak to a certain relationship we have with things. Um, I tend to be drawn to the really confusing ones. Like I find these two things to be really confusing. Um, like why are, why are there so many grapes at antique malls? I don't know if you spent much time there. I, I think I have like seven different iterations of grapes, just, just from antique ones. <laughs> or like this dog, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not, I don't know very much about it, but the stitching is actually really provocative. Like it's got really big seams in the back, like where the, where the butt lines up. Um, <laughs> so there's something about relating to that, I guess, like relating to that feeling of being slightly off. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of associate it with the type of queerness, I guess, or having an eye for um, things that don't quite fit in. Um, but these do are they really, relate to each other? I mean, do they always, are these always a pair? They, they always go together, yeah. Sometimes I put the grapes like they're coming out of the dog's butt. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes... Sometimes I put the grapes like the dog is sitting on the grapes. Like they all, they're all, they always belong together, um, but they do different things together. Um, nice. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of doing a lot of that in my studio right now, just putting together disparate things and introducing a little craft into the mix. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I thought it was intriguing, like that you selected two as if I, I kind of read them as as one piece or a, a significant relationship anyway yeah I feel like they're I feel like they're connected I feel like they're born of the same kind of trying really hard but still being very sad <laughs> <laughs> the pathos of these two tchotchkes mm -hmm. <laughs> okay awesome um, well thank you unless anyone else has a question for Betsy we can well, how often do you go to your antique malls? Oh, yeah, you know, and now the COVID one is not like. Right. Uh, I like the, like the New Buffalo Lakeside, that area. Oh, okay. Uh, 
Harbert, like all, all of those Michigan coast antique malls are just gold mines for weird <laughs> stuff. Um, and my studio is packed full of weird stuff like this. Yeah. These are, these are my shining examples, I guess. And how long have you had these two? Oh gosh, they've been around probably five years, I guess. I imagine I'll make something out of them someday. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Um, and Judith, back to you. Oh, okay. Um, well, this is a big brush I found um, on Milwaukee Avenue near Western. I used to have a, where my last studio was. Um, this was on the street, like on the curb. And I was really thrilled to see it there and find it. I, I do a lot of walking and pick up a lot of stuff, just sort of rusted metals and whatever. I have a, a lot of collections, a lot of different collections. But I, this one, I thought, you know, I could use this as a painting tool. I was kind of searching when I'm in walking about, you know, can I find something that would make a surprising mark or just uh, playing around? And I just thought this was really um, kind of beautiful in its um, movement and hairs and whatever fiber. So it's um, gorgeous. I really, I, it's, it's in my, I keep it in my studio against a window so you can kind of see the light coming through. Yeah. But um, I have a bunch of painting tools and I did, I did try to work with it, but then I, I didn't want to wreck it. You know, I didn't want to, I, it looked too beautiful. So I just sort of admire it. <laughs> that was going to be my question is if this has ever been utilized as a tool. Uh, I think I did try to make, um, put some water base kind of material and drag some, drag it across uh, a surface. And I, I think if I, if I really wanted, I'd have to push harder and move it around. And I didn't want to break it and kind of destroy the, what was there. So mm -hmm. I, I've, I'm not using it as a tool, a yeah. painting tool. I really like this has a form, so I'm, I'm glad that you're not using it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I just like the way, it, you know, it's like a, a bad hairdo that you know, <laughs> is perfect. Judith, why did you look at me when you said that? Oh, <laughs> yes, Matt. Matt, uh, that's um, a perfect match. Oh, my God. <laughs> Judith, I love this brush because it, it gets at something that I associate with your work where it manages to be a tool and a kind of mark making at the same time. Yeah. Um, well, it's you. like drawing. It's like it's a drawing, but also it's a tool. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I, you know, on that, maybe I could try uh, some ink or not paint, but something lighter in weight to see if I could, you know, kind of get some marks from it. But um, it, I don't want to put too much heavy stuff on it. No, definitely not. Yeah. Now, Judith, I know that you've always kind of surrounded yourself with stuff that you I, find, that people give you, I art do. and objects and scraps. Yeah. I, I feel know, like I, you encourage your students to do this as well. I do. Which I is... do. And today, actually, <laughs> one of the students is here today in, the, in this uh, session. Um, I have students uh, ask them if they would like to bring some of their collection or mementos or just share something about them rather than their work. And it's yeah. been, every time it happens, it's, it's like really great because people kind of share what, what they brought and where it came from. And I, I wish, I don't want to put Zeppelin on the spot here, but the <laughs> young man that's uh, with us tonight, he brought a book uh, that he found or happened to come across <laughs> um, in grade school and it's still with him on Mexican art, you know, and he brought it to school and it's, it's, a, it's really was special to see it. But those are the kind of things that happen and you get to know people through, you get to really know more about your students, people when they do this kind of like share this kind of uh, thing in their life, the objects in their life. But I put down, you know, in my notes, uh, the idea of attraction uh, the idea of drawing so something that you're drawn to in a very, pa you know, passionate way, whether it's ugly or horrible or magnificent, you know, this idea of attraction and what that has to say to your own aesthetic, to your own visual 
life and uh, the excitement that that can bring to your work. So it, it is a, not the work, but it has a conversation with the work. So I think it's important and I, I, I've uh, enjoyed do, sharing that kind of idea with my students. So awesome. I don't know, but that- Yeah, I, no, I think it's a great practice. I think it's- things, But, you know, it's nice to see this piece all by itself with nothing around it. Yeah, um, kudos to Holly Merkerson for, <laughs> I see she's here tonight, <laughs> who for doing the photographs of all these objects, because this is a gorgeous photograph. <laughs> yeah, it is really good. Of a gorgeous object. Thank you. Um, all right, well, thank you, Judith. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation. Oh, yeah, no worries. All right, so- uh, I warned you, I, I do presentations. No problem. So do you want me to stop sharing my screen and you want to- no. You're going to cheer girls? Oh, no. Okay. Um, but I, I do want to say I'm having a kind of a dental issue. And uh, so sometimes my mouth doesn't work quite right. And you'll see that I eventually get to the point of that object. <laughs> I have a continued interest in Rococo, an art term that has always and still may be considered a pejorative term used to describe any work that was too frivolous, too decorative, or not performing the serious and moralizing duties of art. And in my case, the paintings and sculptures with scrolls are frivolous and probably often offensive to some eyes at a time when most of us are still reeling from COVID-19 pandemic and injustices that plague our nation. And that's the notion of an artwork at, that it should have a purpose and deal with contemporary issues, especially as seen recently in figurative paintings. That's not me. The decorative Rococo and Chenazere style of my work is colored by my childhood upbringing. My parents were avid collectors of alternative and erotic art much of it Asian, and within a kitsch decor of my father's doing, a sort of frivolous mess. The basic theme of my work has always been love and affection in a hostile world, and thus about disharmony, but also the desire to do the right things when I leave my studio, and about the struggle to make things work. However, in my studio, that is not the case. There are no rules to follow, and in general, that's the way the world is. It functions and it doesn't function. I function and I don't function, particularly in this time of COVID. So when I put these pieces together, they were on a large table in my studio. There was the fish tank thing and the oriental top. I felt that the completed object actually reflected all my interests. However, I was slightly annoyed that the top was lopsided but then decided it does reflect most of my work. There is a lot in my working process that is slightly off because my practice begins and moves to the notion of improvisation, which means there's a certain amount of struggle <clears throat> to make things work. And often the pieces reflect that tension. Now about my own personal collection. My father was a wholesale auto parts dealer and at Christmas time, he would receive boxes of Christmas cards, girly calendars, cups and pencils, upside down, and they were new. My sister and I would barter for them, and each year they were added to my collection. They weren't like today. They were glittery, glittery and beautiful, and I know that this has definitely had an impact on my work. Amen. <laughs> that was great. Awesome, thank you for such a generous <laughs> share. I love that. Um, so just to clarify again, I don't know if everyone caught this, but so this object is something that's kind of, it's two found things, but they've also been fused together, right? So it's kind of part sculpture. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the bottom part is really beautiful. I love that. But when I was making these sculpture scrolls, I, there's just no way I could use it. It's just too bizarre. Mm. It has its own kind of peculiarness. 
Have you yeah. ever painted it? Have you ever painted it? No, but I think a lot of my paintings have aspects of that in them already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Honestly, in my painting, something like this would be a stand-in for an organism. I mean, an orgasm, excuse me. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> oh, um, I mean, I love what you said at your introduction about like all the things that your your studio is not and about not having any rules. And I think that, you know, even especially now, I think that's important, you know, um, to give yourself the freedom to make what you got to make. And I, I think... I think the fact that these for you are also a part of your childhood memory is probably significant too, that in a way this is like um, maybe cathartic in some way. Well, when I said there mm -hmm. were no rules, I, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't necessarily mean, um, because I, I do do a finished product. I, in fact, I'm thinking that I should be a little more experimental and I'm gonna try to do that with some newer work. But I meant is, in my studio, I feel quite amoral. I mean, mm. I raid, I steal, <laughs> I, you know, have sexual activity. I uh, get rid of people really fast. I mean, you know, I, 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 mean, I just don't have the same kind of like good girl behavior that I was brought up to have when I walk outside of the studio. Oh. So that's more what I was talking about. I see, yeah. That's amazing. I, I like that analogy even better. <laughs> um, well, does anyone else have comment or question for Phyllis before we? Yeah, just a quick one. Yeah, go for um, it. I liked in your presentation how you talked about putting the two parts together to make it seem complete or finished or had this logic to it. Because even before you started talking at all about it. I was looking at it and it was just, it like, it, I totally got that. It makes sense or it belongs that way. Like it seems complete together like that. So I, I don't know, there's something that really, <clears throat> I don't know, in the inherent nature of those two objects or something or their arrangement that absolutely says that to me. And so I thought that was really cool that, that you expressly uh, described that happening because it's apparent just in looking. Also, I mean, much to my chagrin, it turned out to be sort of sexual. And my work, <laughs> on the most part, unless the show is telling me it can't be, which is what I'm dealing with. I'm getting ready for a show, which uh, cannot be too sexual because that particular place um, has a lot of children and they want to protect their children's <laughs> precious eyes. But normally, <laughs> I do have elements of sexuality in my work. So that was the other aspect of it that I didn't do it on purpose. It just was the way it happened, but it made sense to me in that regard too. Cool. Well, thank you again, Phyllis. Thanks. All right. We have Deirdre. Hello. Um, so my, my piece is a, or collected item here, is a um, SNH savings booklet. And for those of you who don't know or are too young to remember, um, you used to collect these SNH stamps and fill these little booklets with the stamps. And you're able to trade the stamps in for appliances or other objects. And you really had to collect a lot of them before you could actually get something. <laughs> but when I was, um, when I was going through my parents' house after my mother had passed away and there was a lot collected in the house, this was one of the items was, that was there. And I remembered as a kid, sort of the process of having these stamps and putting them into the little grid squares. Yeah. And so it's the grid, it's sort of the, um, and I always come back to the grid. And so that's one of the things that I, I keep this for is to remember that and that whole process of building in um, from the grid. But then also, I think um, this idea of how something can be accumulated with value, you're accumulating value with something and then suddenly overnight it becomes valueless because at a certain point in time, 
they stopped, you know, doing the SNH booklets and you couldn't turn them in to get anything and whatever you had up until then, you could get whatever you could get with them. So you were left with these booklets that sort of partially filled like this one. And my work is about, um, you know, sort of looking at the modern paradigm of building in options in countermanding that paradigm. And so I use detritus in my work. I pick up plastic bottles and plastic bags and even the subway wrappers from my meals at my studio. There's a subway, only place that's really close to eat is a subway. And so I'll go and I'll get my sandwiches and I'll have the subway wrappers that come back from there. And I collect those and I'll use those in the work that I'm making. So I make physical drawings, sculptural drawings out of these recycled materials, assemblages and installations. And somewhere in here, I think there's an example of one of those with, this, with the subway wrappers that's included in it. And then taking plastic bags and plastic bottles and making lines and volumes out of that to make an image to have something that looks like a beautiful object or drawing um, right offhand, you don't necessarily know that it's made out of these materials, but then as you come in closer and you're brought into the work, you can see it. So I think it gives this realization of what, or thinking about what is disposable, what isn't disposable. You know, we sometimes think of an oil painting as being very archival and lasting a very long time, but of course it matters how it's painted <laughs> in terms of how long it actually lasts. And on the other hand, plastic bags, the single-use plastic bags, we think of as disposable and they just pile up and become a giant you know, floating pile of plastic in the ocean or in the landfill. So I think that dynamic is a really interesting one to think about and that's what I'm interested in in my work. Awesome. Thank you, Deirdre. I, I also remember doing a studio visit with you once where you had shared um, more of that story about when you had to, you know, you're kind of going through your mother's things and, um, I, I seem to recall you uh, gleaning some other materials that then became artworks as well, like some yeah. like yarns or fabrics or something. So yeah, when I saw this, that's the connection that I made. But um, um, yeah, no, my mom, my mom did a lot of knitting and, and sewing and I found in, in, in the place a lot of the yarns and her old sewing basket mm -hmm. and needles and threads and the crochet hooks and all of that. And I use all of that in, in my work as well. Gotcha. Thank you. It's a striking little booklet too, just in its simple design, <laughs> you know, the typography and everything. I wish we could see inside of it. I, you, it brings back a lot of memories because I remember <laughs> filling those books. I, I think I got my first hair dryer. <laughs> You know, with the long tube and the cap yeah. and the whole thing. And, you know, like that was more high, like high school. Is that when you, is, is that around the time you start collecting? Um, I well, know. I think, I think for these, I was quite small kid. Okay. <laughs> um, but um, I think I've always, you know, sort of collected things along the way. Yeah. Um, and I, I, you know, I go through my collections periodically and I got rid of, I get rid of things. So it's this whole interaction with the, um, what is old, what isn't old, what is new. Mm -hmm. It's sort of poignant in terms of what's happening now. And, you know, because people were saving, they were trying to buy things through these booklets. And I don't know, it just seems sad to see these, this booklet in terms of the economy and what's happening. And, you know, what, what are we gonna be doing uh, what are people mm. going to be doing in order to get things that they just can't get? You know, yep. We're going to go back to something like this. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an, an interesting idea, and there's an interesting different means of exchange. You know, sort of moving away from cash, or or you know, mm. money or dollars, and even back to some aspect of bartering. This is a different, this is a different intermediary, but it's, it's, you know, so it sort of serves that function. But, um, but I think the different means, the different economic means of, of trade and, and um, being able to get the things that we need is, is an interesting area to, to think about, particularly now. Yeah, that's really, that's a good point, Phyllis. And um, yeah, thank you for sharing, Deirdre. 
Um, let's see who's next. Okay, we have Eric Wenzel. Um, now I want to, I'm gonna take you off my screen now and you're gonna share yours. Is that right, Eric? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> like Let's that. see. Um, first, I was going to put up that quick. Uh, Do you guys see that? The fire? Yeah. Yep. All right. So, yeah, that was the one. Uh, it's actually very poignant because I forgot that it, uh, uh, Judith was presenting tonight because I think that painting was made in advanced painting <laughs> one of my semesters. <laughs> Was I um, then? Huh? Was I teaching then? Oh yeah. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, at the Art Institute. Um, oh, yeah. the, in the in Columbus Drive building. Yeah. Oh my God. The old, the old days. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you can kind of see on the edges there a little bit of what the painting was originally, and there's a little cartoon character talking, um, and it's a very meta painting. It was a. I was struggling with whether or not to give into making comic books instead of like arty art paintings. Um, and that painting in particular was just my dog character talking about making a painting, talking about painting. Um, and it's something I've held on to for a very long time. And just uh, this summer, I've been kind of going through all my possessions um, to get rid of things. Um, and that's, you know, that's looked like uh, getting all the stuff from my mom's house and stuff that I had in storage for years. And I moved into an apartment with a decent living room and had everything in my storage unit, all, all my years of paintings going all the way back to high school and everything. Cause I've, my parents have downsized and I've ended up with everything. And so one of them was this painting and I uh, took it out on a camping trip and sort of ritually <laughs> turned it <laughs> back to the, the ether. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, let it, let it go. Uh, it's had its, it's, you know, it's like the sort of Viking funeral or funeral pyre or something. Um, and I thought that was a good combo to go with, uh, the, the work I chose, which is Benicula, <laughs> which I'm going to play a little excerpt from. I shall never forget the first time I laid these now tired old eyes on our visitor. I had been left home by the family with the admonition to take care of the house until they return. Hit the wrong button. That's something they always oh. say to me when they go out. Take care of the house, Harold. You're the watchdog. <laughs> I think it's their way of making up for not taking me with them. As if I wanted to go anyway. <laughs> you can't lie down at the movies and still see the screen. And people think you're being impolite if you fall asleep and start to snore or <laughs> so, um, that's, this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> has anyone, uh, is this a part of anyone else's childhood or in my case, adulthood? <laughs> so I, uh, grew up listening to this and, um, in the show, what you have is a, the cassette box. Cause I went and hunted down an original, you know, pressing or whatever of it on Amazon, um, but you also see the cassette, the actual cassette that uh, my mom dubbed from the library copy. So we were a very big library household and many trips there. I mean, that's, my parents taught me if you want to know about something, you go look it up and research it, you know. So that started with books on Bigfoot and aliens and UFOs. Um, and now it's uh, research on mental illness in Weimar, Germany. <laughs> so it, it's all to total. Um, and yeah, she would just make copies of these tapes and some, you know, is it interesting? Do you want to listen to it or not? And this one in particular just grabbed my attention. Um, and I, I still love it. I'll listen to it now if I need something to, to fall asleep and something soothing talking. Um, I'm, you know, playing a digitization of the cassette so you can hear the hiss and everything. And so, you know, as I mentioned, downsizing, getting rid of objects and stuff. Um, some of that came about from like moving internationally and, you know, uh, like I went to Berlin to see if I could do it. <laughs> I could for a short period of time and ended up back in Chicago. But it was like one of the things that I'm taking, I need to have that binicula at least digitally, you know. So to me, it's like the object isn't even just 
the cassette tape itself, which I have and is still very important. It's got my mom's handwriting on everything, but it's like the audio, you know, the, the sound of the cassette, the, the Lou Jacoby is the one reading it and like the construction of the sentences. Um, I don't know. I feel like that. I don't know. It's like high literature or something. The sentence, I shall never forget the first time I laid these now tired old eyes on our visitor. Um, there's just something, you know, I don't know, beautiful about it. And there's, there's lots of humor in it, of course. Um, and yeah, it's just been something I, I continue to bring with me wherever I go. And now, now it's like through the cloud and stuff, I can just access it at any point, but it's still a thing that like, you know, tucks me in at night. Um, nice. Yeah, so that's, <laughs> I will well, it's, return. It's, huh? it's like you're carrying your experiences with you, with the object and pieces of the object. Like, you know, it's the combination of the object and the memories all coming together and creating, re creating and recreating that experience for you. It's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. It's beautiful. Does the narrator do all the voices? Oh, okay. So here's the, the other part. <laughs> I'm just curious. <laughs> what indeed, Chester said, oh. look at these. Whereupon he oh. stuck his paw under the chair cushion and brought up. Oh. There we go. Okay. Um, Let's see. A lullaby in the obscure, never really compares oh. psychiatrist. Dr. Farid Katz, twice a week for some time now. He takes his therapy very seriously. This is the cat. The other morning, I was trying to get a little sleep when Chester came over and nudged me in the ribs. Harold, do you realize we've never really communicated? <laughs> I really communicate. I open one eye cautiously. And in order to communicate, Harold, you have to really be in touch with yourself. Are you in touch with yourself, Harold? Mm. You look yourself in the mirror and say, I know who I am. I am in touch with the meanness that is me. And I can reach out to the you-ness that is you. Mm. I close my eye. I'm That's used so to good. He talks mm -hmm. like that all the time. So, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I love, I love it. it. <laughs> um, and it really fits the, uh, so yeah, he, uh, after all the, the chaos ends, the cat is sent to the feline psychiatrist, Dr. Frick Katza, which is German for Dr. Crazy Cats. Um, and he reads a book called Finding Yourself by Screaming a Lot. <laughs> that, that explains why the cat howls in the basement at night. <laughs> But then I've gotten older, I'm like, oh my God, they're talking about like primal scream therapy that was like a big fad. You know, this was not me, but you know, it's like they talk in part, in parts they talk about uh, things that aren't organic. And I don't know, it just, it's one of these things that I listen to as an adult, it's still really, um, you know, tickles, tickles my fancy. Well, I want to get a hold of this audio copy now. Maybe you can share it. <laughs> it sounds yeah. pretty awesome. Yeah, in, in you act, <laughs> Benicula. <laughs> Benicula. Well, Thank you. I'll release the screen. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. That was great. Um, okay, I need to share my screen again. Work. All right. Can you all see that? Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you, Eric. Um, now we are at Matt. Oh. Matt still with us? Yes, I'm here. There you are. <clears throat> um, these are three bottles of perfume that are part of, I guess, the growing archive. Um, I have used scent in my work um, since, since I was an undergrad. Um, but now about maybe six years ago, um, I started to take steps toward um, blending my own scents. Um, I still use ready-made and found found object sort of fragrances in a lot of projects, um, but I uh, I was also starting to teach myself <clears throat> aroma chemistry, um, and uh, I suppose I started collecting more fragrances as as research um, to try to like uh, pay very close attention to how. 
um, elements of fragrance operate together, how perfume shifts across minutes and hours of a day. Um, and then I think sometime between then and now, um, as I've learned more about, I suppose, the industry as much as the medium, um, I, I feel sensitive to how, how many perfumes get discontinued or reformulated. And so there has become, there has come to be maybe a little bit more of a panic around like wanting to, to, to build an archive that contains significant examples that serve as context for the way I approach um, the medium of fragrance. Um, I, uh, I really resonate with the way Phyllis talks about frivolity and Rococo and her work. And when I look across my practice, I sort of see a, a series of, um, I don't know, strategies that are taken out of um, maybe more sort of superficial concerns. And I'm questioning if I can uh, sort of locate the profundity or uh, a capacity for criticality through them. Um, my home base is always painting. And I think in, in the years that I've been working in fragrance as well, um, I've started to need to reckon for myself the space between beauty as an aesthetic project within the history of painting and art history and beauty as an industry, um, like a you know multi-billion dollar industry that if you go into a Walgreens or a CVS, it's, um, it's prosaic to look up and see a sign that just says beauty on it. Um, and that we, we sort of accept this as part of our everyday context. And so um, as I was working, starting to work in scent as an artist, my, um, my writing, which is a consistent part of my work as well, uh, has, it has expanded to include um, writing perfume reviews for uh, um, a, an international website called Fragrantica, among other things. Um, and so somewhere between then and now, I've become a beauty blogger <laughs> as um, one of my other roles in the world. Um, and so these three, um, I think we selected, I remember sending Kaylee images of a number of bottles and we, we chose some that have like a visual emphasis and a kind of, maybe a kind of harmony among themselves um, because there is something uh, kind of withholding about showing people bottles of fragrance without giving the audience access to tell them. And so um, these three sort of serve as a kind of visual portrait, I guess. Um, of, of this larger archive. Um, and uh, in, in the, in the, I don't know what we call it, the sort of uh, the circulating printed material that adds Donna put together. We have, we've listed the, um, the brands and the date that the perfumes were designed, um, also the designers and uh, the fragrance notes. And so if there's something that kind of combines or connects these three, there's a real emphasis on artifice and powder um, and sort of cosmetic kind of plasticky waxy notes um, in each of them. And I think those are um, of ongoing interest for me uh, in the way that they've been made to signal around gender historically. And, um, and that especially here in the, uh, in the late 80s or in the early 90s, this embrace of synthetic materials and perfumery um, to, to say something about artifice. Um, it's as if there was a turn where the gendering of smell um, started to perform like drag um, and started to be more, maybe more self-conscious or reflexive around that kind of performed frivolity um, that, that I guess I'm interested in. Um, I know I didn't include the, uh, the title information the object information here, Matt, but off the top of your head, do you remember um, approximately like the year? I would not I mean, are they... off the top of my head, so I pulled it up. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, all, all the way to the left is Petit Emmement. Um, it's a Bulgari scent, and it's a really strange scent. It's by Natalie Lorson, um, who I actually recently found this very cheap. You can find it for like $5 on eBay. She designed a scent called Satine by Lalique. Um, which is also really nice, but Petit et Maman is, um, is designed to be worn by mothers and babies. It's an alcohol-free perfume. And so it's this like Bulgari luxury scent to put on babies. 
Um, and it's, uh, it's kind of peachy and powdery and it's got like a really pronounced chamomile note. Um, and in the middle is the very famous classique uh, that was released by Jean-Paul Gaultier and designed by Jacques Cavalier um, in 1993. So Petit et Maman was 97, classique 93. Um, and as I say, it's a very iconic classique you can see in pretty much all department stores. It's been reformulated a few times and they've released flankers, which is insider talk for uh, bottles that are the same scent in principle, but maybe like this one's got raspberry in it or this one's got more tuberose. And so they're like modifications of the, the pillar fragrance from the house. And that's called a flanker? A flanker, that's the word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay. And so this, uh, the classique bottle is, um, is actually a direct send up to an Elsa Scaparelli bottle that was designed by Lenore Tawney, um, one of the Surrealists. And it was inspired by um, the silhouette of Mae West, the comedian. Um, and so this bottle has sort of in it a lot of references that um, are sort of citing histories of art and fragrance. And then the one on the far right is Eden um, by Cacharel. And Cacharel is really well known. They were very well known for their fragrance called Lulu. Uh, which holds up as a really good scent. Um, Eden came out in 1994 and it's such like a, um, it's like see, being in a jungle, but the jungle's all made out of plastic and rubber. rubber. It's a very strange scent, very strong. Um, I like it a lot. I don't think most people do. You can find it for very cheap at like flea markets and um, eBay and things. Um, and so there is the sort of like, as I say, there's like a growing archive where um, I, I just, I think I feel a sort of compulsion and responsibility to sort of give uh, myself like the history of the fragrances that are informing the work I make. Yeah, um, thank you, Matt, this is great. Um, I, I'm also drawn to these as objects too. I think uh, it's, it's hard not to look at these and see like little, little sculptures, little like, even like Bernini or something, um, or um, yeah, I, I don't know. And um, the history, I know I, we've talked previously in studio visits to hear more about the industry and fluctuations and marketing and, and how, um, I don't know, some of the politics even behind, behind the scent is, is fascinating as well. So yeah. I'm excited to see this, um, this turn in your work. Um, yeah, well, and as um, Ciara said, right, right as we were all getting in here, we just, I've just made a fragrance for Oxbow that I'm sure many of you are familiar with Oxbow as an organization. And um, they invited me to design a perfume that I we're releasing in several rounds this fall. Um, it's inspired by uh, Mary Kay, not the perfume brand. Um, Mary Kay was a groundskeeper at Oxbow, um, noted lesbian and also um, is a, sort of a confirmed ghost on campus. So the perfume that I developed is sort of in honor of or in homage to uh, the lesbian ghost on Oxford. I love it. <laughs> um, That's awesome. We're, pr we're pretty happy. I think we're all pretty happy with how it turned out. <laughs> That's great. Cool. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, thank you. All right, so we have Kayla. Hi. Um, maybe not as much of a story, but so this is a reading, it's called a reading painter, as you can see. And I actually have one here with me. That's, oh no, you can't see it. I might have to turn my... We can see it when it's in front of you. Okay. Um, <laughs> I have two of them. Um, but yeah, this is a, an object that I happened upon. Actually, the first year that I moved to Chicago, um, I found it at Salvation Army. And for some reason, I've kept it always one in my studio and one at home, um, which now they're the same place. So I have, <laughs> that's why I have one. Um, but I've never done anything with it. And when I found it, I was so obsessed with it and wanted to make scrolls for it. Um, because what it is, is it's this manual scroll device that scrolls through these text lessons and they're supposed to train you to read faster. Mm. Um, and you can see there's this like little logo of a person at a desk um, at the bottom. But I've always been really interested in 
language that is supposed to be utilitarian, but is accidentally poetic. And so the lessons are like really interesting to me, I think, and the way that they're, they're sort of spaced in these weird ways to make your eyes jump around. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious by the columns. How, do yeah. you know how that's supposed to function? Or? It's supposed to be that you, there's this, maybe other people know this. I have a reading, I have a learning disability. So speed reading is like totally ridiculous to me, but there's a, a speed reading technique that you're supposed to only read the things on the edges of the text. So if you're looking at a book, you look right. at the words on the left and the words on the right and nothing in the middle. And somehow mm -hmm. you'll infer the meaning. Um, so, I mean, it's definitely thinking of language as information rather than language as art or language as anything else. Um, but I thought I would read one to you. Oh, sure. Yes. And cause I'll, I'll have this one here and you can hear it's crazy sound um, when I do it. So this is A's reading exercise two. Hopefully you'll be able to hear it over the motor. It is difficult to define true art. You are your own worst critic. Oh, I have to stop it, I'm not fast enough. A kangaroo, <laughs> is not, a kangaroo is not the tallest of animals. A busy zoo is always a noisy one. Welcome interruptions add spice to a dull routine. It is best to live for today, for tomorrow is uncertain. Some of the best movies are made on low budgets. Accounting is sometimes a tedious task. Dances are often catalysts to new acquaintances. To be a good student, more than a good memory is needed. The dreamer is often the most creative student. Tangled webs are often woven by telling the truth. Clothes do not necessarily make the person. A great deal of time is wasted by inconsequential things. Neglected children sometimes become incorrigible. The simple sentence needs only a noun and a verb. Have you ever thought how ridiculous some words sound? Imagine how verb might sound to foreigners. Chairs are made to fit the contours of the body. Oh, and here's the last sentence. Teaching is not the best paid profession. So that's it. <laughs> <laughs> wow those are like little fortune cookies <laughs> yeah um and i think the one that i gave you for the show there's this one that has um a sentence that says uh the twins on one side and then the other side says we're rarely separated um which is like i mean it's a really simple mm -hmm. thing but that strangeness of like cutting the sentence apart um, because I'm a twin. And I think, Matt, you're also a twin. Um, <laughs> yes, I am. Uh, but so some, I don't know, when I saw it, I was like, this is meant to be, I must investigate this object. Um, that's that. It has never become an artwork. Um, okay. It's just remained. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think we can, all, we can, it sounds like other people have had similar experiences. You bring these things into your studio with the intention of incorporating them into your work, but sometimes they're too precious or too, you know, I don't know, you just don't want to ruin it in some way and they stay with us as objects. But it'd be cool to see if this ever evolves into something else or yeah, even I the performance aspect of it was pretty fun. Yeah, I think I just realized that the texts themselves are so good. <laughs> But maybe I don't need to write one, but there's many of them, so we'll see. I love that you have two of these reading pacers that are pagers. Pacer, yeah. Um, it, it was like a magic trick that we were looking at the photograph and then you held <laughs> the second one. They're, <laughs> like, slightly different. How did it get here? they're slightly different colors. I almost got more. It was like, there. it was a strange thing. Um, yeah, I've been collecting a lot of antique ribbon lately because I'm taking a millinery class through SAC right now and my teacher was like we're gonna need some ribbon next week do you think you have enough and my partner was just outside the frame of the computer and he started laughing I was like I might have enough ribbon <laughs> <laughs> yeah great well thank you Kayla this is yeah. great
I'm glad we got to hear a little bit of it because I didn't know how they worked. <laughs> yeah, and here I'll show everyone. You can change the. Oh no, you can. There's like a dial to change the speed. It's a pretty smart machine. Huh. Cool. Uh, for not needing batteries. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Yeah. Thanks again. Um, okay, so Bobby. Hi everyone. Um, this object, I don't, I hope you can see it. All right. I picked it up in 2013 when I was in Vermont and, um, it was, I was in residence and there was another woman there who was, a uh, making sculpture and she was a huge collector and she said, come on, we've got to get out of here and find, I had no car. She happened to have a car. So we, she said, we have to go thrift, get, do some thrifting. And, um, she took me all over the place and it, I'm forever grateful for her doing that because I think it really opened up uh, a part of my practice that hadn't been there before of, and using found objects literally or just as inspiration. So this piece, it's a small picture frame. Um, there are two cherubs and I was just thinking about this and now it's like, I don't, I just picked it up. I didn't know why I just, it, it appealed to me for whatever reason. And I was thinking about it now when, when I picked this piece up, my dad was in really bad shape in a nursing home and I had to leave. I left for two weeks to go on this residency and um, I remember talking to him and he has dementia, but he still, he knew who I was and we were actually super close during that time period. And I said, dad, you know, I'm going on this trip and he was okay. He said, you know, he wanted me to have a good time. I could tell that. And so I picked this up and I think, well, what ended up happening is I have used it as an art piece, not this in particular, but I made a mold of it. And um, when I was in actually at the Hyde Park Art Center doing the center program, uh, learned how to make a mold from another person who was a sculptor. I never considered myself a sculpture based person, but <laughs> that's what I'm making now. And, uh, and so she helped me figure out how to make the molds. And when I finished there, that little angel you saw in the beginning that Kaylee showed, there's, I forget, nine of those in different iterations. And they're part of a larger piece that became basically a memorial to a friend who had passed away during the time period of the residency. So my work often has to do with loss and um, memory, nostalgia, and in the sculptures that I make, not this particular work, but often there's there's a sense of its sensuality and a little grotesque and hopefully some humor too. So, um, so this happened to be one of those objects that did make it into becoming a body of work. But the, the original piece still exists on its own because it's it's a mold. <laughs> So any questions? Yeah, no, it's such a, um, it's funny because when I first saw the image that you sent, um, you know, it seemed like I'd, I'd seen something like this before, like in my mom's house or my grandma's house, you know, but always with a photograph inside. But there's something about seeing it without the photo um, that's really stark and haunting. You know, the two little figures become very um well i don't know just very it's like more present or something there's there's something a little bit more spooky about it uh, especially you know hearing hearing you speak about your um different situations that have come up like while in possession of this piece it it it, it resonates i guess mm -hmm. kaylee could we see the piece of bobby's from the beginning of the slide lecture again just to see them Sure. Um, let me see here. Oops. I was raised Catholic too, so I think the angels <laughs> had an appeal for me. There it is. Oh, uh, thank Whoops. you. So each one that I, the wonderful thing about a mold is, of course, you can make multiples and each. Oh, of, yeah. 
objects had their own personality. There's one that I made where there's a, and they were all different glaze colors too. And um, one, I actually took a thin piece of, uh, of clay, a, a slab, and, and draped it over the face of the angels. So it's blue. I'm sorry, you'll have to look on my website. <laughs> but it was, the angels were blue, but then there was this white, like sheet almost, over, the, over those figures, but pressed into them. So you could still see like this uh, very kind of ghostly image of what was underneath. So for me, I'm always thinking about that, like internal strife, um, what's going on on the inside that projects outward in some way. Wow, yeah, that's great. So I happen to be in a, at Oxbow right now. Oh, I'm sitting in what? <laughs> Look at that. Do you see this painting behind yeah. me? That's an Ellen Lanyon painting. <laughs> and um, speaking of inspirations, Oxbow has been a huge inspiration in my life. I've been coming here since 1989. Oh my gosh. Yeah, a long, long time. And my kids, for 10 years, there was a family camp that kind of operated under the radar. It was awesome. And, um, and it's really what helped me push myself from graphic design into becoming a fine artist and making my own work. Hmm. Um, and being coming affiliated with the School of the Art Institute because so many people here have gone there. Yeah. And now I'm here because uh, my husband, Steve, is the president of the board of Oxbow. So um, we were here for the benefit, which was a little bit scary because it was an in-person thing and handled so well. Oh, good. There were only 60 people allowed. We were out in the, which sounds like a lot, but we, they did it over three nights. So mm -hmm. six nights but out on the meadow, outside, masks required, social, you know, spatial yeah. distancing. It was handled so well. And, um, well, and good it's, for you that you got to, to see people celebrate. Again. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So thank you, Kaylee. This is an excellent idea to put everyone oh, together. Good. Um, I think we're nearing the end. I might be the last one or who else hasn't gone? Might just be, oh, now I got to go through all of them. Hold on. Thank you for going back to it, though. I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah, no problem. That was, yeah, I should have done that. At, at first, I had the works and the objects side by side in this show, and I probably should have kept it that way. But um, anyway, here we are. This is, so this is mine. I guess I am the last person to, to present. Um, this is a, a weird little, <clears throat> it's just a little toy snake. I'm sure some of you have probably had something like this or encountered some toy like this at some point. This actually, you know, I bought it for my son, Charlie, um, I think at the Nature Museum when he was like two. Um, and we were both pretty fascinated by it. Me, maybe a little more. Than <laughs> really, if you've ever held one of these things, they really do move in a, a very, I don't know, um, a snaky kind of way. Not that I've ever held a real snake. I don't think I could. Um, <laughs> but I just, I kind of fell in love with his sweet little face and um, particularly the movement, the way it, it kind of rolls through your hands when you, um, when you try to handle it. And it's uh, curvilinear nature. It's made out of all these little like kind of half discs of wood that are glued to a rope so that when it moves, it, it moves uh, sort of uh, kinetically, I guess, like each piece kind of moves the next. Um, and it makes a, a, a cool little sound when you, when you handle it too. Um, I have a lot of strange little childhood objects, uh, some from Charlie, some from myself, some from my husband, Jerome, and they all, you know, exist either in our home, some of them are in the studio. Um, I've always collected things and not all of them are incorporated into my work in a one-to-one -one kind of way. Some of them are more obvious than others. This one, again, I liked the feel and the movement, but also I think there's something about its kind of uh, sinuous or, or cur curvaceous um, nature that I think does 
get into my work um, quite a lot, but um, but it's not something that I you know have studied and looked at and tried to like incorporate into a painting. But um, yeah, so my my collections at home are kind of all over the place. I have a lot of things from like walks, particularly like hikes and stuff like rocks and um, little like fossils and things. And this practice, you know, maybe to, to, to wrap this up, it's, it kind of stemmed from, from teachers, from, from people like Judith, you know, <laughs> I took Judith's class many years ago and I had a lot of other wonderful teachers at SAIC that in, always encouraged us to be looking outside of, um, well, to spend time in the museum, but to also just look outside and to notice, take note of what sparks your interest and see if that helps you to articulate um, what it is you're really doing in your own work. And so that's something I've carried with me and something that I also try to pass along to my students as well. Um, so thank you. <laughs> Speaking to Judith right now. But Kelly, <laughs> um, do you, um, is, um, is that Judith, ever I'm, you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Um, I was going to ask Kaylee if you um, if you ever formalize this sort of project of collecting into an assignment in your classes. Um, I and, have, yeah. yeah. How did can how does that happen? Like, what do you like? What are their instructions? It's usually something kind of like this. Um, what I what I did with all of you, which is ask ask my students to pit, um, to pick out something from their homes or just from the world that they're interested in, that they can come and either bring physically, more often it's they take a picture of it and we do some kind of slideshow. And um, I find it can be either a useful introduction in like the first or second week of class to kind of get to know what people are interested in without the pressure of talking about their work. Um, or I've done other assignments where they have to collect many things and really think about what's informing them um, aesthetically, you know, so like collecting uh, shapes and colors and different swatches of um, materials over the course of a semester and making that kind of a, a part of what they do. I love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> it is, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I just oh, wanna... I guess... oh yeah, please. No, that's, that's great. I, I'm sitting here realizing I'm doing an object assignment right now. <laughs> And only am I connecting the two, um, but it's like a intro level painting. So it, um, it's also like to give, you know, a thing to learn how to paint, but it's a similar prompt of like, you know, do, is it, is it something that means a lot to you or is it also something that it's just weird? So you don't have like a sentimental attachment, but it's a thing like you were saying, like the way the snake moves in your hand or something, it has something about it that that's attractive. Um, yeah, it's, I, um, you're talking about specifically about this object, right? Um, yeah, so it's just a weird thing to me. I mean, I, I guess it's sentimental now, maybe, because I've had it a few years, and it reminds me of, uh, you know, my, my son. But, um, but yeah, it's also just kind of this goofy thing that, you know, floats around the house. It's not like up on a pedestal. It has many different homes. <laughs> But yeah, usually the, the things like this are just kind of goofy. You know, I thought it was really wonderful, just this whole um, event and hearing everyone's, uh, the way they spoke about what they had collected, the memories attached. Uh, I really, it was, it was very, it was great. It, it, I, I, um, I, I felt it. I felt I, it, uh, the objects really came more alive and just seeing and hearing what people had to say about them and sharing parts of themselves. So that was really terrific. Yes, thank you so much to everyone for sharing, for lending your precious objects to us for what's now been many months. <laughs> they are soon to come back to you. <laughs> the show closes um, at the end of the month, I think on November 2nd. November 2nd. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I just want to express again my appreciation and yeah, this has been wonderful to work with all of you. Thank you so much too, Kaylee and Hyde Park. Bye. Bye. Thank you.
really yes, thank you, Hyde Park Art Center, for organizing this. Yes thank, yes, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your stories as well. Hope you all have a good night. Thank all you. right. Thank, thank you. you. Last quick. Um, this is being recorded.